They say that um, necessity is the mother of inventions. I think it's laziness. <laughs> if we get lazy about it, we always get to it faster, right? So the remote control is probably like invented by someone who's very lazy to get up and just turn the channels, right? And so looking at this screen, you probably know that what, uh, what I'm gonna talk about next, it's really about something that's very pertinent. It's a buzzword right now. Everyone is thinking about it because it's now rapidly vilified. Uh, it's plastics, okay? And so plastics is always something that uh, corporate, corporations keep asking me. How do we do plastics? How do we get rid of it? I think that's actually not really the way forward to get rid of anything in this world. Uh, we talked over break time today about how people want to phase out palm oil, phase out plastics, phase out anything that's bad. Um, as designers, you know that that's probably not the best way to be so disruptive. But to actually improve the design is what we're trying to do at WWF as well. And so uh, a bit of my background is that I have uh, one of my ex-colleagues here from Procter & Gamble as well. Uh, last time he heard about this was uh, my TED talk when I was talking about what to do at Procter & Gamble with sustainability. And so if we think about plastics, we think about fast-moving consumer goods. Think again, okay? We found out that there's something very different that's happening. So first thing is that this is my old, uh, my, old my, my past life working in the R&D section of uh, Procter & Gamble. We made a lot of products, and they're great products. I still use them today. We found out that plastics now, this year especially, we've heard many different countries phasing out of plastic bags. They're charging for plastic bags, or they're saying no single-use plastics in Europe, right? And so what about the stuff that we keep using every day, right? We find out that there's so many different versions of plastic. This is plastic, okay? Your glasses are plastic. Your phones have many, many pieces of plastic in them. Can you do without plastics? Impossible, right? And so we're saying that let's really stop thinking about this as one collective problem. Doesn't make sense if we think about plastics as one, one single thing. As you know, if you look on any plastic uh, product, you can always see that triangle with the number inside, right? So it already tells you that there are at least seven types of plastics that are being categorized. And so, as you know, there's so many different types of polymer. That's also why there's no viable alternative in sight. Doesn't make sense for us to keep looking for a holy grail. You know what happened 50 years ago? Someone found out that there's actually this um, very cheap, very durable, um, oil-proof, air-proof, water-proof, lightweight product out there that can be used as a packaging material. Which one is it? Plastics. We kept thinking that we can actually solve many, many problems with one thing. And now we're trying to solve the plastic problem with one thing as well. Think again, okay? Second thing is that plastics is always a second mover advantage thing. If Procter & Gamble next day phases out of plastics and uses something that's extremely expensive, guess what Unilever is gonna do? They're gonna follow suit, but then they're gonna have the upper hand because it's gonna be cheaper. And so that's also why a lot of the businesses are not moving until the very end, until um, until everyone's done it. So they'll jump on the bandwagon at the very, very end, we discover. And so, turns out, a lot of businesses came up with these strategies. Okay, you've probably seen some of these. Some of the uh, businesses that you have frequented dropped the straws. Many of them dropped the straws with WBF. Many of them just did it by themselves, which is still commendable. But what next? After the straw, do we drop the fork, the spoon? Doesn't make sense because we need them, right? We just know that the straw is actually more dispensable. We don't need the straw all the time. And so a lot of the businesses are coming out with strategies about not having a straw or actually going for a different design. Okay, so Starbucks actually took another initiative. They tried to use the sippy cup. We've all used the sippy cup when we were toddlers, right? So it's not a stranger to us. But unfortunately, when you look at the whole point of this, is actually we're trying to limit our use on uh, disposable plastics. The sippy cup ends up using more plastics. So is that kind of like a double whammy? I think it is. And so the industry is actually lacking of the direction. There's really no specific direction where everyone's headed. Do we go without plastics? Do we use something else? Do we use glass? Do we use paper? And so everyone is going everywhere and we're really scared as an environmental NGO because that spells disaster. Imagine if everything plastic is now paper. Where do paper come from? We have another environmental disaster. Our forests will be cleared because we're making so much paper. And paper takes time to grow, it takes water, it takes land, it takes fertilizer, it takes everything. So 
that potentially is even worse than plastics. And so if we don't look at the whole picture, we simply jump onto a knee-jerk reaction. And so ineffective, and it's a bandwagon trend that comes and goes. So people ask us, is this just going to be a trend? Because if it is just a fad for a few seasons, we're not going to do this. We're saying it's not a fad. We're, we're trying everything to stop it from becoming a fad. What happened? Why was there nothing so far? Because like in 2015, you didn't hear about plastics, right? It only happened these few years, right? If I remember correctly. So what happened was that we noticed that as an NGO, there was a circle of denial. Consumers say, well, there isn't any other option, so uh, I'll just use plastics, right? And businesses say consumers are not asking for it, and there's no law for it. Governments are saying, well, consumers are not asking for it, and the businesses are not acting. So that it's, uh, it's, uh, like it's facilitating for a, a regulatory landscape that can enable this. If we do this, all the businesses will be angry and they'll pull out. So for a place like Singapore, it matters a lot because we can't just say that, okay, we switch out of plastics next day. What are the businesses going to do for a, a small country like us? Right? It doesn't make sense at all. And so to break this circle of denial, we need to stop the pursuit of the holy grail. Remember that the Holy Grail was plastic in the first place. So um, we worked with McKinsey on this. Whenever I say McKinsey, people think, oh, McKinsey. Actually, we thought of this before McKinsey came up with the solution. But if we say that it's an ENGO, they think, oh, it's a tree hugger solution. We don't want that. So we keep saying, ah, McKinsey worked, worked on this. And so now people are paying attention. Um, and so we broke the entire system into uh, a very simplistic diagram. So if there's anything to learn on circular economy, this is the most simplistic way of viewing it. The big blue circle is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the economy become circular. Now, you've probably heard of that term before, circular economy. We only use what's out there already. In fact, 40% of all the plastics that we've ever used, that your parents have ever used, that your grandparents have ever used, are still in existence today. Either in the format of your chairs that are being recycled, or our recycled product, or in the landfills where they're never to be found again in the living. So we're saying that, why not use these resources that are already out there? And one thing that people actually very um, undermine is that plastics is not just a problem when it tangles up with uh, wildlife or people. It's becoming parts of our stomachs as well, right? We know that plastic is in our poop. Whenever I say this, uh, when the audience is a bit younger, they laugh, <laughs> and then we're adults, so we don't laugh. But um, it's in our poop, it's in our beer, it's in our salt, it's in everything we consume. And we found out that bottled water actually contains a lot more plastics than the water from the Singapore taps. So why are we still drinking bottled water? Does it make sense? Like, if you know about this, does it make sense to you? And so all of that, that actually tells us that plastics is actually a fossil fuel-based material. It's actually never renewable. It's renewable maybe in a million years but then it's not renewable in our terms. And third, it's a climate change factor. It actually adds on to greenhouse gas consumption or emission. And so all three problems, including those really graphic pictures that I'm gonna spare you today, I'm not gonna show you another picture of an animal eating plastics because you've seen so many of them on your Facebook already. So all of that, actually, we've considered every part of it because what we don't want is a holy grail, right? So we looked into that and then came up with a strategy that attacks on every single part of it with the exception of leakage. Leakage of plastics into the waterways or into our oceans is largely prevented only by infrastructure. Okay? We can't stop it from going out. Even with one single piece of plastic out there, someone can chuck it or accidentally drop it into the natural environment. And what's on the ground, let's say if you dropped a plastic bag here in Singapore on the land, what happens when it rains? It gets washed to the waterways and it gets washed into the ocean eventually. Right? And so that's why leakage is something that we cannot prevent with the plans that we made at WBF. But everything else can. We try to boost recycling. We try to limit uh, plastics that's being uh, used once and thrown away forever. We try to use design. We try to actually limit the use uh, of things that are one use. So we try to use things over and over again. But there are limitations and exceptions to that. And I'll talk about that in a second. What we came up with uh, last year, in November, was this plan called PACT. It's a play on words. It's plastic action pla PACT. It is indeed a PACT because it's a group promise. 
We're trying to get businesses like my old employers of Procter Gamble and Nestle to join this. And so, so far we've gotten quite a lot of traction with many industries. What it is is that the overall vision of no plastics in nature by 2030, that's really grand, right? Hopefully we can get all the plastics out by 2030. It would be 11 years to do that let alone like climate change and other parts of uh, environmental problems are still raging on. <laughs> the Amazon fires are still raging on, but the plastic problem will probably take us 11 years to fix. Then under that really grand uh, theme, we have two prongs. One is a sectoral collaboration. We realize that not a single company will move. Remember that second mover advantage? What about synchronization? What if we get them to do things together? Then there's company commitments. This is based on the strategy of reward the best and move the rest. So rewarding the best, who's the best? What does it mean to be the best? Does it mean that um, you have to phase out plastics completely? Is that what we want? Again, it's not what we want. WWF offers our resources as a foundation. Remember that shooting in the dark, uh, the Starbucks sippy cup? We don't want that to happen. We don't want people to blindly switch to another material that we have no knowledge of. Even for paper, we already know paper quite well. We still don't want you to blindly switch to paper bags instead of plastic bags. So WWF is there to point out the way. So this is what happened as a result for the sectoral collaboration. On July the 1st in Singapore, you probably have seen this somewhere or on the news somewhere, is that we got 290 something restaurants to drop the straw. We thought dropping the straw was really easy until what happened in the US. <laughs> So some people are laughing because they probably have heard about this. So at NUS, um, they had the I Reject campaign to drop straws across the campus. Sorry to any NUS alumni here, but uh, it is what happened. So what happened was that um, some students were very furious about this plan because they think it's a cost saving. Um, they're just being stingy. And so it's not just about cost saving, it's about the environment. They got so angry that they bought 1,000 straws and they threw it away in front of an Eagleman's reporter who wrote it into the article. And so we now know that even for dropping the straws, we really need to be tactful. And that's also why we offer the safety in numbers. Instead of just one restaurant doing it, let's say McDonald's did it, we're just gonna walk over to the KFC and get the straw from them. And then KFC will complain to us, say, hey, we're losing all our straws to the McDonald's guys. And so um, let's do it together. Synchronization is really the key because it offers you safety in numbers. That's what we learn from wildlife. If there's one antelope, that's probably gonna get caught by the lion. If you have a pack, a group, a herd of antelopes, then they may actually have a chance of escaping in general. And so of course, the other thing we have is that it's actually endorsed by the government. In Singapore, we know that everything needs to be endorsed by the government. If it is, then people notice that, oh, you're legit. You're not just a tree hugger, you're talking like a legit plants. So this is a sticker that you would find on hawker stall tables or on glass doors of restaurants. Hopefully when people actually go into a restaurant, they understand that this is an environmental initiative. So um, aside from safety numbers, what we found out from the Sectoral collaborations is that people actually have a lot of peer pressure. The representatives of these companies, when they come to these meetings, they get really scared <laughs> because they know that they're not doing much on plastics just yet they're afraid that the NGO person would actually judge them. What we're saying is that it's positive peer pressure. We want everyone to start thinking, to start brainstorming, because you know your industry is the best. I wouldn't know because I've only worked in so few industries. So it's up to them to come up with ways for us to help them, to boost the industry norm as, as a result. So if three people does it, it's probably not the norm yet. What about 300? What about 3,000? Okay, so we're trying to set industry norms through these sectoral collaborations. And best yet, at these tables, there are always the sharings of best practices. So a lot more businesses are willing to offer their strategies. And last, economies of scale. If one company buys alternative material that's more expensive, they're gonna get a very expensive uh, quote, right? But if all of us move on the same speed or, at that, or relatively at the same time, we actually get a better deal as Singapore, right? So what we did was that we rounded up these guys. Notice that these guys are all the food delivery companies. We all remember before, before them, we didn't use that much plastic, right? And so they kind of came like quite nervous and then they came to our round table event and then they were like, okay, what are you gonna do with us, right? Of course, we're not gonna point fingers with them. 
to them, but we're saying that why don't we work together on a supplier agreement? Because we know that they have a very tight uh, requirement on the restaurants. They have to be safe, the, the food has to be safe, uh, the food has to be great, um, the experience has to be very positive for the user. And so what about sustainability? Have you considered that to be a requirement for your upstream restaurants? Not yet. So that's also why we have the birth of the very first sectoral collaboration for this industry. This part I'll not talk a lot about, but if you are interested in what happens to the best of the best, champions actually need to go through all of this. It's actually, it looks very complex, but if you remember the blue diagram that I showed you earlier, it's just every part of it. We just try to tap on every part of it to make sure that we deal with it holistically. We deal it with the system in mind. And this is what it looks like when a company signs are packed. They become effectively a champion and they're being showcased on television. They're being showcased on our round tables. Uh, we actually get them a lot of interviews for newspapers so that they can actually tell people that this is now the industry norm. What's better a testimony, testimony if it's not an industry member telling you that the new industry norm is this? It's easier than the panda saying it. And so we celebrate them much better. Uh, we celebrate them with a lot of media. We celebrate them with a lot of endorsements and also with a lot of technical resources. We do, we do provide our assistance with them throughout the journey. It's not like they sign a deal with us and then we just let them go roam free. Also, this is something that's not new anymore. If you're older than 20 years old, you probably remember that about 15 years ago uh, when hotels started implementing this thing. What it is is that uh, at the hotel night, night tables, you would see a placard that says, uh, for the environment or for water saving and detergent saving, uh, we're not gonna wash your sheets unless you put this card on your bed or if you uh, want to reuse your towels, please hang them up. If you don't want to reuse them, we can change them for free, It's just, just so that you put them in your bathtub and we'll know, right? This is something similar. Instead of actually giving the endorsement or the narrative for water and detergent, we're doing it for plastics so that companies understand where this is coming from. And last, just to show you a bunch of companies that actually some of them uh, we, we've mentioned, the previous speakers have mentioned, We've now 18 signees in Singapore alone. And I'm happy to announce that this plan is not just being launched in Singapore, it's being launched in Thailand, Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippines, and partially in Japan, and partially across Europe. So this is a very homegrown Singapore design approach. We are trying to make sure that it works. And it, the, the, the thing about environmental problems, problems is that we always build the plane after we take off. We don't have the luxury of actually having a very large lead time to design a project like what you designers do. We find out about the problem and then the solution was actually required 10 years ago. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. And so that's also why the PACT uh, commitment makes a lot of sense. We try to get companies to commit first and then we design the rest of the strategy for them. There's a forward vision being brewed by WWF right now to make sure that these companies get what they want. And you notice that they're from all different sectors. There's so many different sectors, and especially I like to point out the hospitality sector. Why are they in there? Because hotels use a lot of plastics, even front of house, back of house, any part of the house. They're much more prone to work on this problem because each night at, let's say, a Fullerton or Hilton is a few hundred dollars. And the plastic is only a few dollars, or maybe a few, so just some cents for them. So they're much more prone to work with us so to get them to be the first bunch of lab rat to test out many solutions is the best strategy. Guests love it, they love it, we love it. It's a win-win scenario. And of course, to break the circle of denial, uh, we had to go very innovative. We started um, sending out a lot of surveys to make sure that people are actually okay about, about these, um, these strategies that we propose. And so a lot of the people in Singapore, more than you can imagine, 81% of the people support change. Okay, and we found that 91% of the people actually are willing to be inconvenienced if they find out why. So if you tell them what this is about, why are they being inconvenienced, why are they being charged with a small amount, they'll do it, they'll happily do it. 95% of the people think that there's a problem with plastics. It means that there's no better time than now to start. And with that, um, another design uh, strategy that we have and this is the very last thing I'm gonna show you, is that we have something called the decision-making tool being designed right now. 
what it is is actually a self-help tool. We can't always sit there and be, be the help desk of hundreds of companies. If they want questions answered about plastics, we hope that we can develop a tool for that. So this is what it is. We try to get companies to answer questions about plastics. Look at the clicker that I have. I think these guys will use the clicker for the next few years, right? So this is not meant to be disposable. What about that cup outside? What about the forks outside? For, that fork is cornware, by the way, so it's made of corn. Uh, all those things are actually used in different capacities. The conditions of use, use needs to be considered when we look into alternatives. What's oil proof, what's waterproof, what's lightweight, what's uh, malleable, what needs to obtain, uh, retain its shape? They're all very different. They're applied to different uses. And so that's also why we're developing a tool for these companies to use so that they can actually just work out the decisions, ask themselves the questions, and come to conclusions so that they find out what alternatives are available for them. We try to scale up so that with this, we don't have a person who's attending the help desk and I can only help one person at a time. They can also help self-help. They can also tell us what, what's out there, what's new, so that there's no rock unturned. So rules of thumb for dealing with environmental problems like the plastic problem is that we need to unlearn everything. Plastics was a part of our lives until a few years back. And we order uh, our food from these delivery services without thinking too much about them. But now we actually need to go back. We need to trace our footsteps into this part that we need to look at the system holistically. What was wrong with the system? Why did we come to this place? It was all because we were trying to pursue something that's a one-size-fits-all solution. Stop thinking about that because there will not be a silver bullet. Plastic itself is complex enough, let alone with other environmental problems. We always need to look at it, begin with the end in mind. If we don't, we, will, we, will, we or our kids or our, our next generations will still, still have to deal with the problems, like how we deal with the plastics today. And also, business as usual is not okay. We can't just add more design onto the rest. A great example is that, why is the toothbrush paired with the toothpaste? Every time you go through a tube of toothpaste, you have to get a new toothbrush. Does that make sense to you now? Now that you've heard about this, it does not make sense. And so to decouple that, to stop thinking that, uh, because historically we've always done it that way, so we keep designing new dental sets to be the same way. So we need to think about the strategies because the environmental cost needs to be weaved within. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me.